Thank you very much. For the, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, also very, I'm very grateful for being given the opportunity to give this lecture here on this occasion. Okay, let me start. Uh, How can I? Uh, it says here the host uh, had the Freibergabe des Teilnehmer Bildschirms deaktiviert. Ah. Okay. So okay. you have to become co host, then you can, I think now you can try again. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So the concept of family in Islam, in contrast to the uh, previous presentation uh, by Professor Sautermeister, I'm gonna take a historical approach. I'm gonna look at this uh, concept from starting from the uh, pre-Islamic Arabian setting. Um, to see sort of the contrast and the changes that happen between family and the perception of family in pre-Islamic Arabia and the early Islamic period. I will then um, look at the developments in the later medieval period and conclude by looking at the early modern and modern period and what family in the Islamic context means in those periods. With regard to uh, scholarship um, on the concept of family in Islam, we have to say that there is still a shortage and there are few studies on family history in Islam. Certain themes uh, certain themes have been, been given more attention than others. Uh, some of those themes are, for example, social units and hierarchy, uh, marriage and divorce uh, has been addressed more recently in scholarship as a way to sort of shed light in the inner workings of families and so forth. And of course, uh, gender and the role of women have uh, received quite a bit of attention in recent decades. Scholarship on women, especially related to Islamic law, has grown substantially, especially sort of in the early modern and the modern period. Uh, we also have a number of studies, for example, on children and youth uh, that are related, of course, to the setting of family in Islam. Naturally, these aspects uh, will be discussed here. But to start, uh, I would look, I'd like to look at a family in pre-Islamic Arabia in order to appreciate the changes that happen after the coming of Islam. Uh, when I say pre-Islamic Arabia, I mean the Arabian Peninsula obviously uh, where uh, Islam is believed to have originated. So very briefly, pre-Islamic Arabian society is tribal. That means that people identify through their tribe, even though before the rise of Islam uh, in the fifth and also the sixth century, uh, people seem to have moved and uh, associated more in clans because tribes seem to have become uh, large. But the clan, the sub-tribe, if you like, is the basic social and political unit in pre-Islamic Arabia, even amongst semi-nomadic and settled people. Of course, the idea is that a clan, that, or that in a clan, all full members of a clan uh, are of the same blood. But at the same time, it, it is very common in pre-Islamic Arabia to have guests in your clan and your tribe, people coming from other tribes uh, or other clans. And therefore, the idea of adoption is very prominent in pre-Islamic Arabia, the adoption of other clansmen and people from other tribes. 
four reasons of acquiring manpower, for example, or uh, to change the, gen the gender ratio in a clan. Now, because of that, it is believed that uh, temporary marriage in pre-Islamic Arabia was very common for such guests or people coming from other clans and tribes. They would marry into those tribes, uh, marry a woman of, well, uh, the, 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 the clan that they were brought into, giving a, a dowry to the bride's guardian rather than the bride herself. And it is also believed that in this setting, uh, you had polyandry on occasions. In other words, that one, one woman was married to several men at the same time. Offspring in this setting of temporary marriage would of course stay with the wife and her clan. You would have other forms of temporary marriage. Uh, we, you know, we, we learn about uh, forms of sort of lending one's wife to another uh, person or man, obviously in order to sort of uh, create noble offspring or exchanging wives and so forth. There's also regular marriage in uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. And it also seems that uh, divorce was rather common in pre-Islamic Arabia based on rather elementary rules. Because of the presence of temporary marriage as well as polyandry, there have been suggestions in scholarship that at one time and in specific, certain regions of pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, the family structure was matrilineal, i.e. that it would go through the, the female side rather than patrilineal, and that this only moved to a patrilineal Patri uh, patriarchal um, kind of family structure before the rise of Islam. However, there are other voices um, who suggest that this has been overstated. But just to give you sort of an idea uh, about the scholarship uh, in this area, in any case, one other feature that is very prominent in pre-Islamic Arabia is infanticide. Um, the killing of young infants, which we also know from other antique civilizations, uh, it afflicted and affected rather uh, both male and female offspring, although it seems to have been more of a, uh, a problem for female uh, offspring. Uh, reasons for this uh, have been found in extreme poverty, uh, the gender ratio and also uh, infants being offered to pagan gods. Uh, obviously, these infants would be buried alive after birth. What changes then when, excuse me, uh, to the early Islamic period and the early Islamic concept of family? What, what are the changes that we can perceive uh, that happen? Well, one thing uh, that is very obvious is that there's a clear move away from the tribal clan identification to the nuclear family. The nuclear family receives most emphasis at the expense even of the extended family. In other words, those who live in one house and have a shared lineage. Uh, you have here uh, terms, al ahl bayt ashira qurb and so forth, uh, which all are in one way or another way uh, related to family in the Quran. Some of these terms obviously have other meanings as well. Adoption in the early Islamic concept of family um, is prohibited. Um, as I said, it's a common uh, custom in pre-Islamic Arabia. Uh, Muhammad himself is sort of the example for this because he has an adoptive son in uh, Zayd ibn Haritha. And uh, well, this Zayd ibn Haritha uh, is basically commanded to retain or retake the name of his biological father, father uh, Haritha, rather than Muhammad, even though um, he's Muhammad's adoptive son. Islam, early Islam, uh, also clearly 
commands a patrilineal patriarchal family structure. That means that a husband is in charge of his wife or wives or um, female slaves, that uh, sexual relations are permitted in this setting, but that the offspring is attributed to the mother and not the father. Uh, for example, one verse that is often um, quoted in this context of the Quran is, for example, men are uh, caretakers of women as men have been provisioned by God or by Allah over women and tasked with supporting them financially. Marriage is, of course, the preferred institution of the family, uh, the legitimate set, uh, setting of sexual intercourse. Other than that, there is only uh, concubines. And the Quran puts quite a bit of emphasis on marriage. Uh, we have, for example, uh, this verse uh, in the Quran and one of his uh, signs and God's signs is that he created for you spouses from among yourselves so that you may find comfort in them and he has placed between you compassion and mercy. Adam and Eve are, uh, are generally seen as the sort of the first individuals in the setting of marriage and marriage and partnership. Marriage goes as far as even the setting in paradise being uh, in this kind of framework. Sexual intercourse outside of marriage is of course forbidden, considered fornication, zina. Marriage aims of course at procreation, at offspring, also in order to ensure the continuity of the community. However, the Quran also warns against becoming completely preoccupied with one's family. Uh, one should sort of uh, keep, keep it sort of balanced and also look at sort of um, obviously work for the hereafter rather than just for this world. Uh, there are a number of rules who Muslim can uh, get married to and who not. For example, Muslim can get married to their uh, uh, cousins. They uh, can marry uh, slaves or people of the book, but they cannot marry polytheists or people who are of closer blood than cousins. One very important point in choosing one's spouse is also that they come from comparable backgrounds. Men, Muslim men, are allowed to marry up to four wives, uh, but they're supposed to treat them equally. Uh, usually, uh, one of the verses that is often quoted in this context is this uh, Quran verse uh, of the uh, Surah Nisa, verse 3, if you fear that you will not deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry those that please you of other women, two or three or four. But if you fear that you will not be just, then marry only one or those uh, your right hand possesses, in other words, slaves. Uh, that is more suitable uh, that you may be the main that you may not incline to injustice. This very verse, uh, on one hand, singing uh, justifying uh, polygamy, is oftentimes also quoted to uh, argue that actually the Quran itself has doubt about whether men are capable of balancing more than one wife. Uh, People like Harold Motsky, for example, have argued that actually polygamy is discouraged and the ideal is monogamy in Islam. You know, uh, of course, the, the Prophet Muhammad himself had nine wives, but that is sort of uh, seen as a special dispensation. One thing that uh, speaking of uh, speaking of Muhammad's wives. Uh, one thing that symbolically speaking uh, is also interesting, also with regard to what Professor Berger said and sort of the nation being considered a family. Of course, uh, 
Muhammad's wives are also known as, or became known later on as the mother of the believers. And so the Ummah, the Muslim community, could also be seen, symbolically speaking, as a larger family. Anyway, returning to, uh, to marriage, uh, in Islam, marriage is a contract. That means the consent of both sides are, uh, are required. That doesn't necessarily have to be the bride and groom. It can be, at times, a guardian, especially for the wife. Uh, but consent is needed by both sides. And in general, marriage in Islam, or early Islam at least, uh, is seemingly more about alliance and finding a good social match rather than emotional attachment. One thing that is very important, however, is the dowry, or some people also call it bride's wealth, or or dower and so forth. Uh, this is something that is crucially important in the contract of uh, marriage in Islam because it is also a transfer of wealth. Uh, it would in the Islamic period become a important source of economic capital for the wife because as opposed to the pre-Islamic period when the dowry was often given to the guardian or the parents, by extension of the wife in Islamic period, uh, it was given to the wife herself and therefore constituted uh, economic capital that she was able to um, use. The dowry in general in Islam is usually divided into a advanced or prompt part, which is paid uh, upon conclusion of the marriage and a deferred or delayed part, which is paid at the death of the husband or in the event of divorce. The dowry is usually determined by a number of uh, factors, uh, such as you know, uh, the female relatives of the wife, her place of residence, uh, whether she's a virgin or not, where, uh, how beautiful she is, and other personal qualities. But in any case, uh, the, uh, the wife is due a fair dowry. With regard to rights and responsibilities and duties uh, in the setting of marriage, uh, the husband is not only supposed to pay a dowry, but he's also supposed to maintain his wife to pay maintenance, to uh, make sure that she um, has lodging, clothes, and food and so forth. He is responsible for this on his own, even if his wife uh, it comes from much better circumstances or if she's wealthy and he's not and so forth, that doesn't make a difference. And it also, of course, includes the shared children they have. At the same time, the husband, uh, however, has the right of sexual intercourse with his wife whenever he desires, with the exception of, for example, uh, her menstruation cycle or Ramadan or Hajj and so forth. In general, man has the authority uh, and his wife is supposed to be obedient to him in the marriage. And he's even allowed to use physical means to ensure this, we are told in the Quran. Uh, we find here in the Quran verse 434, uh, the second part, first part we already read. Uh, and if you sense ill conduct from your women, advise them first. If they persist, do not share their bets. But if they still persist, then strike them lightly. So uh, that has often been taken as an indicator or as a suggestion for that. Uh, however, in terms of rights for women in this context, as mentioned, uh, and in contrast to pre-Islamic Arabia, women uh, acquire, or wives rather, acquire uh, economic rights. Uh, they can use their dowry. Um, uh, they inherit, they're uh, permitted to own property, and they're also uh, able to bequeath. And so they acquire a legal, legal status, which it is believed they didn't have in uh, pre-Islamic Arabia. However, if things don't work out, um, divorce is a legitimate option. 
uh, after having explored, of course, all other options such as arbiters and waiting periods and so forth. And so in general, uh, it is assumed that uh, divorce is, is easier to be attained uh, uh, than in Judaism and Christianity. What are sort of the most common forms of divorce? Uh, there's, for example, talaq, uh, which is a unilateral form um, of divorce uh, or repudiation uh, by the husband uh, without even um, the wife having to be present. Uh, what uh, happens later on is then uh, that there's a three month waiting period uh, which follows this uh, repudiation and where it can be sort of revoked and things can go back to normal, i.e. people uh, can continue being married Asset, uh, this uh, talaq or unilateral repudiation is revocable up to three times. The third time it becomes irrevocable. Um, there are also cases where we have triple um, talaq or triple repudiations uh, in which sort of the statement of repudiation is mentioned three times in a row. And that also becomes of course then irrevocable. Another common form of divorce is uh, the well, what they call hola, which is usually a divorce for compensation, in which the husband accepts the wife's proposal. Excuse me for divorce uh, for compensation. In other words, she gives up or pays back part of the dowry that has been given to her, or she renounces the rest of the dowry that is due to her, or something else, uh, depending a little bit on the setting. Another common uh, divorce uh, or way uh, of divorcing rather is the judicial separation or annulment, uh, usually due to failure uh, to fulfill the conditions set in the marriage contract. In other words, failure to provide maintenance uh, or non-payment of the dowry, sexual impotence and so forth. Obviously this is also usually irrevocable. So this is, uh, these are sort of the basic points of the early Islamic concept of family. Let's uh, move on to sort of the development in uh, the later medieval period, uh, highlighting some of the main features. There is, for example, uh, the difference between the different Sunni schools of law uh, with regard to marriage and, and family, uh, more broadly speaking. Obviously, they agree uh, in general, but there are uh, differences and divergences in certain details. Uh, to give you a number of examples, because we obviously won't be able to, to uh, uh, outline all of this. But for example, they disagree uh, about female consent for marriage. Uh, so whether a woman can be married off by her family without her consent, especially, specifically a mature woman. Uh, for example, the Maliki school and the Shafi school say, yes, this is possible, while the Hanafi school says, no, uh, a mature woman cannot be married off by her family against her will. Uh, for example, the amount of dowry, there are disagreements as well. The Hanafi and the Maliki school, for example, say that the, the wife is due a fair dowry, which has to be, well, at least in accordance with the factors that we've mentioned. While the Shafi school, for example, uh, says that whatever the two parties agree upon, even if it's only a very insignificant uh, uh, amount or of insignificant value, is a fair dowry. Uh, very important for the later period, also stipulations and clauses in marriage contracts. Uh, there are different opinions. Uh, for example, the Hanbali school is much more accepting of stipulations and clauses included in the marriage contract, while the other law schools uh, see that as something rather negative while legally still binding. With regard to maintenance or the lack thereof and the lack of maintenance of the husband of his wife being grounds for divorce, there's also different opinions, for example, for the Hanafi school, 
uh, even if the husband doesn't pay maintenance for a year for his wife or doesn't maintain his wife for one year, that's no grounds for divorce. While on the other hand, the Shafi school uh, are, uh, or some of the Shafi scholars argue that already three days uh, of failing to um, provide maintenance for one's wife is grounds enough for a divorce. What about the differences between Sunni and 12th Shia Islam within this context? Uh, the one aspect that, of course, everybody points to is uh, lies in the temporary marriage, the so-called mota'a or mota'a al-nisa, uh, sometimes also called sire or as the wajimawat in Persian. As we've seen before, and uh, as I've tried to show, a temporary marriage is very common in pre-Islamic Arabia. However, it is believed that either Muhammad or Omar ibn al-Khattab, the second uh, Rashidun Caliph, abolished it, or that both together abolished it. Uh, and for that reason, it is no longer accepted in Sunni Islam. So Sunni Islam uh, abolishes uh, temporary marriage, considers it fornication, zina. On the other hand, 12 Rashiism retains it uh, based on uh, some of the thinking of the of Muhammad al-Baqir and Jafar al-Sadiq, the fifth and sixth uh, consecutive imams in 12 Rashiism. It is, however, even in 12 Rashiism, uh, temporary marriage is already in 12 Rashiism considered a lower form of marriage, not really suitable for virgins and only acceptable in exceptional circumstances. Why is that? Well, because the wife uh, in temporary marriage is not considered uh, as one of the four actual wives. Uh, she doesn't receive any inheritance. Uh, and oftentimes she, uh, she doesn't receive any maintenance either from her husband. And oftentimes there's not even a common household. So therefore, oftentimes those temporary marriages are concluded in secret. They need no witnesses nor uh, guardians if the woman is mature. However, it still needs a contract where the duration of the, the, the temporary marriage is specified, where the dowry uh, is also specified. And of course, there's no divorce to temporary marriage. It just terminates. However, if there is, in 12 or Shia Islam, if there is offspring coming out of this temporary marriage, then this becomes legitimate offspring of, uh, of the father. Twelve Shia sources usually, excuse me, point to this verse of the Quran uh, as support for the idea of temporary mar marriage or muta, uh, specifically this part. So, for whatever you enjoy from them, give them their due compensation as an obligation. And there is no blame upon you for what you mutually agree to uh, beyond the obligation. So istam uh, tum here it comes from the same root as mota. This is for one seen as indication uh, or referring to this temporary form of marriage. And then also a lot of uh, 12 Shia commentators read this part, ujura uh, hunna as ila ajalin musamman, i.e. Uh, to a well, for a fixed time period. This may seem very creative in the sense that they simply re, uh, read certain passages of the Quran in a in a different way. But actually, this is in line with some of the early variant readings of the Quran by, for example, Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Kab and others. And there's also, there's actually also quite a number of. Uh, companion traditions uh, of people counted sort of into the Sunni tradition, which actually support uh, temporary marriage. Where else uh, do the Sunnis and the Twelve Shia uh, differ, uh, differ um, in terms of uh, marriage and family? Uh, for example, in Shiism, uh, the repudiation of the husband requires witnesses, while Sunnism doesn't, at least initially. Uh, also, 
Shiism doesn't accept uh, triple repudiation, um, uh, basically repeating the statement three times in a row on one occasion. And inheritance law is slightly different uh, in 12 Shiism in the sense that uh, the 12 shares that are established in the Quran for the close relatives in Sunnism, once these 12 shares have been uh, divided and distributed, the rest goes to the agnates, in other words, to the uh, male part of the family. One Shiism, uh, it goes to the closest family, be, be that may, uh, it goes to the closest relative, excuse me, be that male or female, it doesn't matter. So what does the, um, the typical family, from what we can tell, look like in medieval Islam? What does the typical family life look like in medieval Islam? Um, from what we can tell, uh, monogamy is the uh, predominant form of marriage in medieval Islam for economic reasons that it just, it's, it's very expensive to have uh, you know, several wives, each of them having their own house and so forth. Uh, other reasons that uh, scholars believe that monogamy is the kind of the, the predominant form of marriage in medieval Islam is, for example, uh, because of scholarly um, references by people like Ibn Sina, who refers to it as the ideal, or Ibn Josie, who uh, seems critical or, or, well, yeah, critical of it or doubtful whether uh, this can be done in a proper way. And also, if you look, for example, in um, literature, medieval literature, Persian and Arabic, all of the sort of famous heroes of love are couples, yeah, so the, the sense of monogamy, the Vishen Ramin, Shirin and Khosro, Leila and Majnun, and Joseph and Suleika are all couples. Polog polygamy or, uh, did exist for sure, uh, but people believe that it is uh, limited to rulers, leading families, maybe some very wealthy merchants and so forth. It seems that uh, divorce and remarriage uh, was far more common uh, than polygamy on the whole. One other thing that is common at the time is endogamy, uh, especially amongst the upper and higher middle classes. They tended to intermarry, particularly to the paternal cousin in order to preserve property and to strengthen the ties. With regard to the inner workings of the family in medieval Islam, we know relatively little. We know, of course, there is quite a bit of gender segregation, uh, also depending a little bit on the social and ethical background. Upper class uh, women are, tend to be more segregated uh, because this is also sort of a mark of prestige. Uh, that doesn't mean, however, that upper class uh, women didn't have influence in the sense of, you know, having people work for them, slaves, eunuchs, and also servants. Lower or women of lot more uh, sort of of lower origin, of uh, more, more modest uh, social um, standing, were, however, very present in public. Uh, that can be sort of uh, derived from kind of the social criticism that this receives uh, in medieval works by people like Ibn al-Hajj and Ibn Abdun and others. These, uh, if you like, uh, lower class women would work as, in regular jobs as servants, midwives, uh, wet nurses, and, and, and so forth. There is, of course, also uh, the concubine or the female slave in medieval Islam still, uh, which is a legitimate option for uh, a Muslim man uh, to have sexual relations with. Uh, if such a female slave, a concubine in other words, uh, becomes pregnant, then she or gives birth to a child, she becomes a unwallet, uh, she can no longer be sold and attains uh, freedom upon the death of her master and the offspring that she gives birth to uh, becomes a legitimate offspring of her master too. The traditional assumption in medieval Islam and even later on is that of the patriarchal Muslim family, the male head who basically of the family who has all the authority over all the other members of 
the family. This has recently been challenged. Uh, it is believed now that it's a little bit more complicated than that, a bit more complex in the sense that uh, there were multiple relationships and networks within the families, uh, the hierarchy being more horizontal than vertical. And that women in particular enjoyed quite a bit of leverage through their dowry, through formal loans, which they would make to their husbands, uh, through relationships with other members of the family in which, through which they created networks uh, and so forth. This then leads to a variety of uh, asset networks, hierarchies within a family, which are sometimes uh, or depend also on gender, age, rank of birth, and whether somebody is free or enslaved. One uh, thing that I do want to address very briefly uh, in this context is also um, sexuality. Uh, it is generally believed that Islam uh, is more, uh, quote, uh, sex positive, unquote, uh, than, let's say, for example, Christianity. Uh, the reasons for this being, for example, the depiction of paradise and the central pleasures in the Quran, uh, certain hadith, for example, uh, this, the second one here, uh, in which uh, is attributed to Muhammad, in your world, perfume and women have become dear to me and delight was in my prayer. So uh, basically the importance of, per, uh, of sensual aspects like perfume and women. Uh, or this one found in uh, the book of Anawawi, uh, um, reading, in the sexual act of each one of you, there is charity. Uh, there's also, in medieval literature, both poetry and prose, uh, a very, a very prevalent element of eroticism, uh, which, um, have pe which people have taken into consideration and used to make this judgment that uh, it is, Islam is more sex positive. Uh, ob obviously sex is, or sexual intercourse is for procreation uh, and celibacy is usually frowned upon. Um, coitus interruptus uh, is reportedly accepted um, by Muhammad as well as most major legal scholars. However, we have to also mention that in medieval Islam, there were quite a, a, a number of uh, circles which downplayed the importance of sexual intercourse, of sexuality, uh, in coming from a sort of an ascetical background or a mystical Sufi background, or even from a philo philosophical background where sexual uh, intercourse is oftentimes related to the sensual and sort of the animal pleasure. Um, I don't think I have time to go through the remaining points, uh, sort of the notable scholarly contributions of people like Ghazali, Ibn Arabi, uh, and Ibn Qayyim al josiah I think uh, this will have to wait for the, uh, the article. Now, briefly, the early modern and modern period In the Ottoman period, so we're talking here about the 18th, 17th, 18th century, uh, a lot of uh, scholarship is, is focused on this. Uh, it is generally believed that people, especially women, have better access to courts. A lot of courts were being built at the time. Uh, and therefore, marriages and oftentimes, of course, also divorces are settled in courts. And therefore, we have a better idea of what is actually going on, also because we have documents from those courts and so forth. One thing that stands out from this sort of early modern period is that a lot of clauses and stipulations are included in the marriage contracts uh, from people from different walks of life and segments of society. These uh, stipulations, of course, if not fulfilled, would be then used for judicial 
uh, divorce, what kind of things did people include, in particular women would obviously include those, for example, uh, mistreatment of, and beating of wives, uh, state and um, places of residences where people wanted to live, uh, specific allowances because of clothes and so forth, uh, or also because uh, certain women want to, wanted to continue work outside of home after they got married and they wanted to be uh, to have an assurance for this. Uh, the most common or one of the most common stipulations is that the husband doesn't take a second wife or concubine. Uh, and that also shows that polygamy in this period is rather rare than the norm. As said, divorces are also registered in those uh, court documents and usually, uh, well, usually it, it is the mentioned uh, uh, divorce for compensation or uh, the judicial divorce uh, that we find in them. But in general, in the Ottoman period, uh, it is believed that women have more influence uh, in their families than and households assumed and that they're heavily involved in property rights, uh, uh, inheritance from their inheritance, from their dowry uh, and so forth. With regard to the modern developments, what are the sort of the most prominent changes that we can observe in the 20th century? Uh, Muslim families mostly have morphed into nuclear families. This is uh, attributed to the modern reforms uh, in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, these modern reforms, uh, the adoption of uh, Western codes of law in the 19th and 20th century, also uh, are believed to have brought about changes uh, such as limiting the inheritance rights of the agnate relatives, limiting uh, king control over marriage by setting minimum age for marriage and so forth. And also, of course, one important issue is the female or the, the women's consent uh, to a marriage without a guardian. Even Islamic law has adjusted to these changes uh, and adjusted to nuclear family uh, law. The ideal of marrying paternal cousin that was previously the, uh, the case has waned, is no longer an issue really. Uh, slave marriage, of course, is no longer practiced. Uh, with that being said, however, uh, it is still mostly believed that in the household slash family and sort of typical male female relations, uh, gender roles haven't changed all that much. With regard to debates that um, are taking place at the moment, just uh, very briefly to allude to, some of the most common uh, debates right now is whether marriage is a commercial transaction or a social transaction, in other words, property for property or property for status and relation. Uh, some people uh, have looked at the potential or what they believe to be distortion of uh, classical Islamic life from sort of the ideals of Islam, the original ideas of Islam, sort of the imposition of a male-oriented middle-class law based on personal reasoning and customary practice rather than ethical uh, considerations in of the Quran. The role of the Sharia, of course, uh, is treated rather frequently as sort of the last bastion uh, blamed for the lack, the last bastion of conservatism, excuse me, and blamed for the lack of progress. Uh, while other people, however, have pointed to sort of the flexibility of Islamic law and being more flexible and fluid than assumed and able to accommodate individual needs and changes and therefore basically saying that Islamic law isn't the problem. Uh, other things are, or other aspects that are being discussed are so, uh, to what degree the reforms of the authoritarian states uh, advance women rights or not. Okay. Uh, I think that was pretty much what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.